on Friday we went through sort of the steps, the logical progression of scientists when trying to figure out the genetic material. Right? And we left off sort of they figured out that something is transferred from one generation to the next. They came, became chromosomes. Then chromosomes were made up of DNA and protein. So then they went through sort of the, the ideas of, or experiments that decided it was DNA. And then uh, we scientists were sort of debating whether it was DNA because the structure wasn't there yet. And that's sort of where we left off. All right. We knew that DNA was a polymer of nucleotides, and we know what nucleotides are made up of. Right? And we left off we, at the end of class on Friday uh, talking about Chargraff's rules. All right, Chargraff was a, a, a scientist and he was looking at the composition of DNA across species. Right? And he, so, so, what nucleotides make up that DNA? All right? So, across species, there was always some different. All right? And it was basically evidence. Uh, of that DNA, a more credible candidate for genetic material, okay? We know the structure of DNA now, all right? So it's double-stranded. We'll go through sort of structure-wise in a minute. Well, here's your, your structure of DNA, double-stranded. Adenine binds to the thymine, and cytosine binds to guanine. And Chargraff, when he was going through his, his experiments, Looking at DNA across species, you said it varies. But the, the makeup of DNA varies across species. So that adenine, the amount of adenine or thymine base, bases in a dog versus a cat is different. Okay, which you would expect that to be, depending on the type of DNA. All right, and look at RNA structure as being. Okay. So, Chargaff came up with, we know that the nucleotides, and this is the structure of DNA, all right, and we'll get through the sort of the double stranded nature of it in a second, all right. Each strand of DNA, all right, runs in a certain direction. There's directionality to the strands, okay, and at this point, Chargraff hadn't come up with this, but he knew that there was a polymer of, of DNA, of nucleotides together. He does, you have to wait till Watson and Crick come up with sort of how all this fits. Okay? But here's the nucleotide guanine, or thymine, adenine, cytosine, guanine attached to their phosphate, or, or their sugars, and then the phosphate sugar backbone. Okay? You'll note that it runs in a five prime to three prime direction, all right? So that here, okay, you'll note that this is a, that's the five prime carbon that's on the sugar, <coughs> all right? And off of that five prime sh sugar is a phosphate group, all right? Phosphates are linked from the five prime and the three prime sugars, all right? So right here and right there on the, sh on the sugar. Right? The carbon on the So that when we say DNA runs in a five prime to three prime direction, this is going phosphate. Sugar. Phosphates are on five prime, three prime, five prime, three prime. Alright? Basically making sort of rungs of the ladder that we say DNA is structured at. Alright? Keep this in mind. Because this is important when we get to the, this is the structure of one of the strands. This is important when we get to the function of how this is replicated. Okay? So you have a five prime, there's a phosphate group, and at the end where there is not another phosphate, there instead is a free three prime OA. Right? You see that OH group right there, that alcohol group? That is very important. That structure is very important in the replication and the formation of adding new nucleotides to the bottom. 
Okay? So keep that in mind when we go back, when we talk about the structure and the function of replication. All right? That 3 prime OH is absolutely essential. Okay? Sorry. Yes. All the other ones are five primes? Yep. Okay. So, you'll see, so having that free OH group is important. That's a, a, it marks an open space for another nucleotide. All right? Everywhere else, there's not a free front, there's not a free three prime OH. Instead, it's occupied by a, a phosphate group or something else. So, that, that's important for, that structure is important for the function of replication. All right? We go back here. Where's the linkage going to occur? What's going to be added to this, this end 3 prime OH? A phosphate. a phosphate group. So there's a phosphate that's going to be, linkage is actually going to occur through the, one of the oxygens on the phosphate. All right, and so here's, oh, here's a nucleotide structure by itself. All right, so where's the linkage going to occur? We go back. Here we have... Your, your nucleotide by itself, right? The five prime, the five prime phosphate, the free three prime end. So even if this phos, this, excuse me, this nucleotide was added to the end of that other chain, what is it going to end? Add what's still going to be there at the end of that chain? The open spot. The free three prime OH is always going to be added on. Okay, so when you're adding this nucleotide in the five prime to three prime direction, you're always adding on another three prime OH. You're leaving an open spot at the end. All right. Well, that will come into the importance of that will come probably on uh, Wednesday. So Shargraf became uh, came up with his two rules: the fact that there's a different variety of nucleotides right, between species. The base composition varies between species. But in any species, the number of adenine and thymine bases is equal, and the number of guanine and cytosine bases are equal. Right? And the reason for that, because why? They pair together. Okay? So cytosine binds to guanine, adenine binds to thymine. So if they require to be base, base pairing together, they would likely that they would be in equal numbers. All right? Now, the reason for this was sort of Chargraf came up with these uh, results prior to the structure of DNA being produced. All right? But these findings actually help produce the structure. Okay? Watson and Crick used this these results by saying we're trying to figure out the double helix model. And we'll get into that in a second. Okay? So, the double helix. Watson and Crick were first to determine the structure of DNA. They won the Nobel Prize for this. Okay? Other individuals who were instrumental in this, Wilkins and Franklin were using a technique called X-ray crystallography, which is a... Um, Involved procedure where you actually form a solid crystal structure of a molecule and then expose that to X-ray radiation. And because of the structure being there, there's a diffraction of the X-rays themselves. And as there's the, you utilize the, you analyze the diffraction pattern and come up with the structure of that that um, molecule. All right, so Franklin produced a picture of the DNA molecule. Not necessarily a picture like a photograph, like here it is, but giving sort of dimensionality to it. Giving sort of how wide the two strands are. The fact that it was two strands. And sort of how the composition fits into a structure. All right, and then Watson and Crick used that, Chargrass rules, et cetera, and composed a model that fit those parameters. All right, 
Here's Rosalind Franklin, her X-ray uh, diffraction photograph of DNA. So you can uh, you can imagine that you can measure sort of the diameter from one end to another, being a certain size, right? And then whatever these things are also have to fit within that diameter of the structure, right? And that's sort of the, the results that that Watson Crick utilized to build their model. So, so it was revealed that DNA was helical, right? It also enabled Watson to deduce that the width of the helix and the spacing of the not nitrogen spaces, all right, and the pattern suggested it was made up of two strands forming a double helix. All right, so all of that's well and good, but now we have to sort of fit the composition of DNA into its structured model. And then how is that going to work? All right. Questions up to there. So we know now here's sort of the key features. And this is, we're going to go through this in a little bit. That the two, first Rosalind showed that it was double helix. All right. And then Watson and Crick are going to build that model around it. So here's your double helix, all right? There's a certain structure. There are roughly 10 base pairs per turn of the double helix, all right? So, which is one turn rep is roughly 3.4 nanometers, meaning that the spacing between base pairs is about 0.34 nanometers. And we can get into all the structure of it, the diameter, one side, etc. All right. It's important because every turn, right, you fit those 10 base pairs in, that's normal DNA. There are other forms of DNA, all right? The helix turns in a certain direction, all right, what we call left-handed, all right, in a, in a rotation. There's another form of DNA where it spins in the, it actually turns in the opposite direction. Okay? This is all called normal DNA is called is in the structure of called B DNA. Right? There's A DNA and then there's Z DNA. Z DNA turns in the opposite direction. A DNA is a little more compact, meaning that there's more than 10 base pairs per turn. More compact makes it more difficult to break open, for gene expression, etc. The left-handed turn, again, is specialized structures within chromosomes. Okay? You'll note the directionality of this. All right? So you have 5 prime to 3 prime. 5 prime to 3 prime. The two strands, the double helix, run in opposite directions. They are what's called anti-parallel. They're parallel, but in opposite directions, <laughs> meaning that sort of the 5' prime phosphate, 3' prime OH, is orientated opposite or facing each other on the two straight. Okay? Think about a two-way street. Wilbraham Avenue right behind you is a two-way street, separated by yellow lines, one on the oncoming and the ongoing traffic. Right there, traffic is going... Um, facing each other, all right? But the two lanes are parallel. Questions on the basic structure of B-type DNA? All right, there's your space-filling model, just <coughs> sort of showing. You'll see that there's also a certain type, there's a groove, okay, that's formed. And you can, this is best visualized under... Uh, this. So here, if I zoom into this portion of it, okay, you can see here's the two, the two strands. One, oh, let's do that in green so you can see it. Here's one strand right there, and there's the other strand. Now this strand will go sort of behind the other, right? And in this case, when this turns, comes around, it forms a major groove in this area. This is what we call the major groove. Right? Look at the 
look at the diameter or the space between this strand here and this strand. Okay? There's a bigger opening there. Based upon the, sta the stable structure of DNA, it has to turn and have a little more space between those two strands. Okay? That is called the major groove. Basically between those two. All right? A minor groove is the next turn. So you see the double helix, you have the space between these two strands, right? One, say this is strand A, and this is strand B. Right? A comes around here, right? And B, we'll do in... Uh, red. All right, B goes around this way. Okay, so the strip, but the the distance between two opposite strands, right, B and A here, <coughs> it represents the major group. All right, why the difference? But there's also a separation between the two strands that is a little bit smaller. Right, and this represents right about in this space, okay? That's called the minor groove. Minor because it's, what's the diameter between these two strands? Is it more or less than the other one? Less, okay? These grooves are important. Why are these grooves important? Think about the function of DNA. So we're going to have, for replication purposes, there has to be something that goes in and separates these two strands, right? The, the minor and major groove are where proteins bind to DNA, okay? So that they can, you can imagine a, uh, a protein comes in here, globular structure protein, and binds to this. All right, it binds to that, and then when that happens, it sort of bends the DNA and puts pressure on the interactions between these organic molecules. All right, when that occurs, that the tight the bond between those molecules is sort of stressed and causes them to open. Okay, again, structure of the DNA is related to its function, so. Replicating enzymes that will replicate DNA, enzymes that will cause transcription, right, cause gene expression, will bind to the major groove and force the DNA open. Okay? In opposite to that, there could be proteins that bind the major or minor groove and make the DNA more compact. Okay? Make it more compact, not uh, or or make it more resistant to replication, gene expression, transcription, etc. All right, so structure related to the function in terms of what DNA is util utilized for. Questions on the major and minor groups? All right. So, Watson and Crick, they built models to conform to the sort of the parameters set forth by the x-ray thing, uh, x-ray uh, measurements. And... Franklin figured out that the two outer phosphate sugar backbone, all right, and the nitrogenous bases were more pointed in the interior. And so Watson and Crick had, you know, six, seven, eight things already set up for them out of the ten that they needed to come up with the model. So what did Watson and Crick then figured out the orientation of the two strands and how the bases were or uh, were paired together. All right, so Watson built the model. The backbones were anti-parallel, right, opposite direction. And then he thought the bases were paired like adenine and adenine, but such pairings didn't result, were, didn't conform to the structural parameters. All right, so if you had an adenine that was, that was linked to an adenine, that doesn't, 
the width of that doesn't fit the width of what we're seeing in the x-ray crystallography. Okay? Would adenine adenine linkages also fit Chargraff's rules? Why not? So if you always paired an adenine to an adenine, a thymine to a thymine, would that fit Chargraff's rules? Why? Well, the rules fit A pairs with T, but, but in terms of the other point that there's always an equal amount of adenine and thymine in whatever species you're looking at. If adenine always paired with adenine, and thymine always paired with thymine, there would have to be an equal number of adenine pairs and thymine pairs. Right? And that's not always the case. Okay? And then the variation between species would be would be fine because that would just be a species specific thing. Alright? But instead, using Chargrass rules and the and the measurements, Watson and Crick came up with the idea, or what we now know is the pairing between a purine and a perimeter. Okay? And it actually fits. With that, it fits the measurement. So here's your purine to purine, right? The two ring structures actually forming hydrogen bonds that would force a bulge in the DNA, or it wouldn't fit the diameter that was measured from uh, the crystallography experiments. Okay, <clears throat> the pyrimidine is too narrow, right? So it would for do, again, doesn't fit the measure. The purine pyrimidine uh, pairing fits measurements so that the phosphate sugar backbone is within the same structural parameters. All right. So that so then you, that means you're uh, and I I think this is uh, whoops no your guanine cytosine. Okay, make linkage. Now, as an interesting note, these are purine or purine purine linkages are found in DNA. Okay? Every day in the summer when you go outside and you're in your bathing suit, you're playing in the pool, and you're, you know, you have you're exposed to UV radiation, your cells are producing these linkages. Okay? These are called thymine dimers. All right? What does that do to DNA? It causes it to pop out. All right? So that this thymine dimer now, let's say, if this was a DNA backbone, it's going to pop out like that. All right? This is an important structural property. Because thymine dimers are not good for you. You know, UV radiation causes, is directly linked to what? Skin cancer. cancer. Alright, well, where does skin cancer come from? A genetic mutation. Most likely. Caused from UV radiation. Well, how does a thymine dimer lead to a genetic mutation? Changes the base pair sequence. Changes the base pair sequence. Okay? Because now this will be recognized if this is Thymine, thymine, when this is, this is the template in the gene, now that gets, goes to RNA, and that's an A, and then it's, it's a big deal, right, rather than it being the same. It can, can lead to various problems. But because of the structure, we've adapted to recognize that. It's important for your cells to recognize and remove these, th these dimers. Yes in order to prevent skin cancer and other problems. So there's actually a way to repair DNA. And because of the structure, the bulge of the purine, sort of link, the, the, pure, uh, the thymine dimer linkages in the phosphate sugar backbone, there are proteins that recognize that and will clip that out and put the right base pair in. All right? DNA repair mechanisms, important in preventing cancer. 
Okay, again, structure, function, relationship. Okay, so now Watson and Crick reason that the pairing was more specific, di uh, dictated by your base st structure, so A to T, C to G, right, and also explains Chargaff's rules, right, so the, in any organism, the adenine is equal to thymine, the amount of adenine is equal to thymine, and the amount of guanine is equal to cytosine. Questions on uh, purine permitting linkages, all right. So here are your uh, linkages together, adenine to thymine, guanine to cytosine, and forming the normal structure. Okay, you'll note that adenine to thymine forms two hydrogen bonds, while cytosine and guanine forms three. Okay. Again, this is important or the structure of these bonds is important to function, okay? Areas in the DNA that are very high in these C, what we call CG base pairs, cytosine guanine base pairs, we call them CPG islands, okay? Because they are, they end up forming a tighter bond between the two, the two strands. Why? Because more hydrogen bonds are present. More hydrogen bonds, tighter the association. Okay? So if you have a, a, stripe, a portion of DNA that has a high percentage of cytosine guanine base pairs, it takes more energy, effort to separate those base pairs or those strands later on. No, there's lots of reasons they're there. Um, typically, the well, CG base pairs are in areas that are not genes. In other words, they are used in regulatory regions of the DNA prior to genes. They are in areas where uh, the DNA is not active or is not transcribed. Um, so there are reasons for that type of close association. All right, questions on that, on the structure of DNA? Okay, we've sort of touched on, utilized the structure, giving you a background of what it looks like, and touched on what its function is going to be, all right, and how it relates to function, okay? The main function, well, the primary, I wouldn't say primary, um, DNA has two main roles, okay? Number one, instructions for all the genes in the body, all right? So that's its, really its most important function, is to contain the information of all the genes and dictate which proteins are made when, where, and how, okay? Its second function is that it is passed on from one generation to the next, right? So that all those instructions get passed on, all right? So we'll go through sort of the relationship between structure and function here. And really, this is where Watson and Crick made their Nobel Prize winning discovery. Because of their structure model, it actually also laid the groundwork to form the functional mechanism of replication and how DNA is passed on from one generation to the next. All right, so it suggested you're copying your genetic material. And now we know what's going to happen to this molecule. You know, you've gone over this in, in biology, you know the basics of it. What's going to happen? Here's your parental molecule. What has to happen? So it's going to split. It's split, right? Each of those parental strands then serves as what? A template. a template, right? So a protein is going to bind this to this DNA, separate it out, and then it's going to fill in the gaps, right, with the, with the new strand. Then you end up with the formation of a new strand complementary to the template strand. 
Okay, so the original parental DNA serves as a template to make a new complementary strain. All right, that was the suggested mechanism. All right, and we know now that, well, that was the suggested mechanism. They had no real, say, data to produce that. All right, at the time, now, argument between uh, biologists about how that sort of worked, right? And we call this a semi-conservative model because so part of the DNA is conserved from the original parents, all right? So the basic pr principle is that base pairing to a template strand, okay? So you have ATCG on the template strand, now you have... Uh, TAGC on the complementary strain. All right. So the parent, the parent molecule unwinds. The two new daughter strands are built based upon your base pairing rules. So Char graph, the Watson and Crick model, and then uh, we're all put together to develop this sort of mechanism of DNA replication. <clears throat> but now we had to find a way to actually produce it. So Watson and Crick's semi-conservative model predicts that when double helix replicates, each daughter molecule right, will have one strand that's parentally derived and one that's complementary and brand new, or newly synthesized. At the time, there were some competing models. Okay? Competing models basically saying that two parent strands somehow go back and find each other Again, and that's conserved. Right? That is a conservative model. Okay? And then the other model was what's called dispersive. That instead of the, there being a template, everything, all the DNA disbands and then reforms with a mixture of parental and newly synthesized DNA. Okay? So this is what the models look like. All right? Here's your conservative model, and somehow the parental cell DNA is conserved over time, right? So at some, that would, if that was the case, some cell in your body at some point would have derived directly or have the DNA that directly was from the first cell of your development. Okay, the semi-conservative model Right, which we sort of the, te the DNA template strand when the parents are kept, all right, uh, kept together, form templates for the others, and then your dispersive model. Okay, these three models were proposed. How can we? How can we definitive? How did? How would you definitively? Test to see which one this was, which one was true. Can you think of a way to develop an experiment or a test that would show you the semi conservative model is actually the one that's present? Think about it, talk about it, Abby. So tag the parental strands and track them throughout, okay? And that's exactly what what occurred. Meselson stall experiment basically supported, well, I wouldn't say supported, but supported, I wouldn't say proven, but supported the semi-conservative model. And so what Meselson and Stahl did was they exposed bacteria to a radioactive tag, similar to the um, Hershey Chase experiment, okay? So that all the DNA that's being produced at, in that bacteria will then be tagged. And then they removed the tag, and then they looked at where, what ha occurred from there. All right. 
we'll go through it like this. Okay, so I'll zoom in and move it down here. So experiment one. Okay, so the bacteria is cultured in medium with a heavy isotope of nitrogen. Why nitrogen? Where it does it appear in DNA? It's not in the base. All right, so it's going to specifically tag the nitrogenous base. All the bacteria that are growing in here are going to have that heavy isotope of nitrogen. Right? Then from there, they take, this is going to represent your parental strand. Okay? From there, they take a, a portion of that and move it into a, a lower or a lighter isotope of nitrogen. Okay? Now all of the subsequent DNA is going to have the lighter isotope, which they can go back after however many rounds of replication and separate out the two, the two isotopes based upon their, their weight. Okay? So now you can go back and track to make sure what's what. Okay? So they take a DNA sample after the first replication and they find one band. That one band represents what? Why one band? It's half of a pairing. It's half of a pairing. Okay? This represents... This band represents one half from this and one half from that. What is that? So, heavy and light, this one band is somewhere in between the two, okay? So showing that there's a mixture of this. What does this first, this first result say to you? Does this support or refute any of those models? Okay, so it supports the semi-conservative model, okay? What else does it do? What about the dispersive and the conservative model? It supports the dispersive model. Does it support the conservative model? No, why? Because they're mixed. The conservative model said that somehow the parental strand got back together and was conserved over time. If that were the case, what would you expect in the first in your first DNA sample? They would still be that heavy isotope would be together. Right? So that it would look something like like this. Right? And you'd have one here and then one there. Right? That's not there, so you can rule out the conservative model. Alright? Oh, they allowed, so that's the first replication. After a second replication, they took another DNA sample. Okay. Now, the second sample showed two distinct bands. Okay, one up here, one down there. All right, this is the lighter isotope band. Okay. This was a sort of an intermediate isotope band. Why two bands now? So, so the second round of replication, what's happened? The light isotopes. The light isotopes. Still together. Right, they're still together. So after the first round of replication, you have a mix, heavy and light, right? When they separate, now they, they serve as the parental molecules for the next round of replication. You're going to have some cells are going to have a heavy and light strand. Some cells, most, more cells are going to have two light strands, right? What does this, con what does this say? Does this support or ref which model does this support? We've already ruled out the conservative model. Now, which model does this support? The semi-conservative. 
Why does it not support a dispersive model? What would you expect to see if you saw if it was a dispersive model? You would expect to see the same thing? Where is it, the DNA samples going to be if it was a dispersive model? So if it was like this, dispersive means everything breaks up and forms back together in equal amounts. Right? So if that was the case, you would have one band that would always, after every round of replication, would get less and more and more closer to the lighter, sub, the lighter uh, isotope because the heavy isotope is being diluted out over time. Okay? So it, only, it would always be one band right? if the, diver, if the dispersive model were true. All right? So it would be somewhere closer down here. But because the semi-conservative model is what's present, that you have the separation among bands. Over time, if you were to continue this out, another replication, what's going to happen to this higher band? It's basically going to disappear because it's going to be diluted out over time. All right? So here is what occurs. Here's your conservative model, semi-conservative model, and dispersive model. Okay? So your conservative model, we know sort of that broke up because there wasn't the for formation of two bands, so we ruled that one out. The semi-conservative during the, over the first replication and the dispersive over the first replication look the same. Okay? After the second replication, though, we show that they have two distinct bands, and with the dispersive model, the, the presence of two distinct bands ruled out the dispersive model. All right. So the Meselson-Stahl experiment supports or confirmed that DNA replication is a semi-conservative mechanism, right, where the DNA serves as a, or the parental DNA serves as the template to make new DNA. Questions on the Meselson-Stahl experiment? Go from there. All right. Questions on anything else about DNA? Structure, function. All right, on Wednesday, we'll actually get into the nuts and bolts of DNA replication. All right? All right, I'll see you guys then.